Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, that time Oxford students and town folk battled over a pint and the hilarity that ensued. Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to say that it's brought to you by Shaker and Spoon. Shaker and Spoon send out a cocktail box each month with all of the ingredients you need to make bar quality cocktails in your own home. So why not grab a Shaker and Spoon box and have some friends around for cocktails this summer? And even better, you can get $20 off your first box by going to shakerandspoon.com forward slash brain food. And let's get started. Oxford University is well known as being one of the most prestigious and elite places of learning in all of history. Over the years, it has seen some of the finest minds the world has ever known pass through its halls. It's also the place where, over six centuries ago, a bunch of students and a fair number of townsfolk were killed in a riot over a pint. While many details about what has come to be known as the St. Scholastica's Day Riots have been lost, and others are occasionally conflicting given the documentation of the day, which is perhaps not surprising when reading accounts from two groups that detest one another, we do know more or less how things transpired. For starters, in every reputable account, the riots began on the 10th of February 1355, which just so happens to be known as St. Scholastica's Day. A day of feasting meant to honor St. Scholastica, the sister of the perhaps more well-known St. Benedict. On that day, a number of Oxford students were drinking at an establishment that was called the Swindlestock Tavern. It was at this point that two of the students began complaining about the quality of the ale on offer. Now, who these students are isn't actually known for sure, but it's often claimed that they were named Walter Springhus and Roger de Chesterfield. Whether those were really their names or not, the students were extremely dissatisfied with the quality of the alcoholic beverages that they'd been served, and they complained to the landlord. This was somebody supposedly named John de Croydon. Allegedly, the landlord responded to these complaints with stubborn and saucy language, which, if you've ever been in a pub, is probably how 99% of all landlords would react to being rudely told that their drinks taste like pig swill. The students, not very satisfied with the landlord's attitude, decided that they'd express their displeasure by hurling their tankards directly in his face. What happens immediately after this isn't exactly clear, but eventually the infuriated landlord roused the local populace by ringing the town church's bell, which in turn caused the students to do the same with the bell located in the university's church. Both sides rallied to this call. Soon after, a riot erupted between the two groups when arrests against the two initial instigators were attempted. The riots quickly grew out of hand, including an estimated 2,000 additional townsfolk joining the fray after rumors of the riot and the sound of ringing bells reached the countryside. Bouts of violence involving bows, arrows, swords, axes, and of course fists continued well into the night and through the next day. Ultimately, the townsfolk managed to storm the university's grounds and kill 63 students, as well as injuring many more. The students, in turn, reportedly managed to kill upwards of 30 or so of the townsfolk during the melee. At first glance, this may seem a little over the top for what seems to have started as a fairly minor altercation between a handful of people in a pub. But the thing that we need to keep in mind here is that at this point in history, the university and its students had a ludicrous amount of power over the town to the point where the students were, in many ways, above the law. As noted in the book Student Resistance, A History of the Unruly Subject, at the turn of the 13th century, thousands of students roamed the streets randomly attacking hapless citizens and sheriffs who couldn't touch the marauding students out of fear of state retaliation. In fact, only a little over a century before, another riot between the Oxford students and the townsfolk had started after students murdered a townswoman. Some of the students fleeing the riot ultimately helped found the University of Cambridge, which is today the second oldest university in England after Oxford. Beyond more or less being above the law, the students were also exempt from being able to be sued in court outside of their diocese, as well as exempt from paying certain taxes. Needless to say, from the beginning up until somewhat recently in history, significant clashes between Oxford students and the surrounding townsfolk were relatively frequent. The university and its students were able to get away with all of this because at that point in history, Oxford was essentially just another arm of the church, meaning its power was pretty much absolute. 
This was no better proof than when Edward III caught wind of the riot, and instead of trying to get to the bottom of what happened, he decided instead to impose harsh penalties on the entire town and arrest any citizen he felt had something to do with the riots. These penalties included, among other things, forcing the mayor to march with a bare head to the university to beg forgiveness from the vice chancellor and then pay a fine of 63 pennies, one for every scholar killed, on the anniversary of the riots every single year for all of the rest of time. This was a tradition that was upheld for almost five centuries, right up until 1825, when the mayor simply refused to continue the practice. On top of forcing the mayor to beg forgiveness on behalf of the townsfolk every year for just under half a millennium, the university was also initially given control of certain trade in the town, including the trade of wine and beer. So, in the end, by all appearances, it would seem that it was the landlord's fault for not brewing better alcohol and then having the audacity to have his face get in the way when a drink was thrown at him. So I really hope you enjoyed the video and now it's time for one of my favorite sponsor spots because for this one we need to go to my home because unlike Don Draper I don't have a bar in my office. All right, so here I am at home. Got my shaker and spoon box. They have these really nice boxes. I hope you can see that the light is just kind of coming in from the side there. They have these really nice boxes that kind of get ruined by uh by the various custom stickers that they stick all over them because they have to ship these to me internationally because I'm over in Europe and these normally just ship to the states. But Let's open it up and see what's inside. Ooh. Iced coffee concentrate. Coffee beans. What is this? We got a uh, oh, ginger ale. Nice with blood orange. Bay leaf syrup. Spiced blackberry. Seasonal berry. Bitter cube bitters. Celery cordial. And you don't want to miss these little things. There's always little things hiding in here. What is that? Angostura bitters. Now that is... That is one supply I actually have in my cupboard. Okay, and very importantly, this, this is the good stuff. In this little envelope, we have, and this is like the third or fourth time I've got a shaker and spoon box. So I got a bunch of these recipe cards, and what I like to do is I just, I, I mean, I keep them all, but I put my favorite ones on the top of the pile. This is probably gonna have a lot of my favorite ones. This is the broken bourbon box. Gonna decide what to make. This one called Into the Void. Boom. Old fashioned. So this is like a very, it seems to be a very interesting take on an old fashioned. Probably gonna make that one. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a front runner. Hand cut lemon peel. Now, oh, important thing. If they are not shipping this internationally, they will include things like a lemon. So, uh, but they don't wanna ship this all the way around the world because that would be, that would be kind of crazy. So I, I bought my own lemon, this very knobbly lemon. Look at that, that looks really cool. Let's make some drinks, shall we? This is, this is why these guys are one of my favorite sponsors. Uh, one more thing they do not provide is the booze. Basically, you buy one bottle of booze and you've got three cocktails to make. You make four cocktails from each of the recipes using one bottle. So they provide everything else. I think so. I like this gentleman, Jack. So uh, making cocktails is all well and good. I, I, I do enjoy making cocktails, but you know what I like more? Drinking cocktails. So uh, the moment of truth, the taste test. By the way, this giant block of ice in here, I don't have any special ice maker. I just get a Tupperware box, fill it with water, freeze it, and then chip off giant blocks of ice because then it melts slower into the drink. Let me, I'm, I'm looking forward to tasting this. With bourbon. You're not gonna go far wrong, put some bitters in there and make it kind of like an old fashioned, my favorite drink. It's probably gonna go pretty great. That though, whatever that extra stuff, what was I adding into there? It's berry sage reduction. I'm not entirely sure what a berry sage reduction is. And then there's the cherry bark vanilla bitters as well. Whatever it was, it makes it really amazing. This is a great box. What box is this? The broken bourbon box. Anyway, let's pop back to the studio and I can tell you a bit more about the details of all of this. I'm gonna enjoy my cocktail. So that's Shaker and Spoon. It really is a fantastic company providing great stuff. And as I said at the top of the video, you can get $20 off your first box today by going to shakerandspoon.com forward slash brain food. And do bear in mind, this also makes a great gift. You can find a link in the description below. And thanks to Shaker and Spoon for sponsoring. And thank you for watching.